defining and redefining 21st century Italy. Pull up a chair and join in. Hey, welcome back to Ciao Bella. Today I'm sitting in the countryside, and if you could hear, wait, they're not doing it right now, there are birds chirping, and I'm here with Alessia Antonori at the Fattoria di Fiorano. Ciao, Alessia. Ciao, Erika. Hello. It's so great to finally meet you in person. We've talked on the phone, we've talked on Skype a few times, but I'm really, really happy to be able to come out here. And it's so, you know, one of the things that you reminded me immediately when I came out here was we are sitting in Rome, but we're not. Absolutely. We are uh, sitting uh, 20 minutes from the city uh, center of Rome, and uh, we are inside the borders of the city of Rome, of the eternal city. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's quite special. I think it's, I think it's amazing because I think when people come to Rome and they, and they think of Rome, they think of antiquity, you know, crashing into contemporary build or well, Renaissance buildings, but also a contemporary city. And we're in the middle of the countryside. It's a triangle of paradise, and uh, it's a property uh, that my grandfather, uh, uh, Alberico Boncompagno Lodovisi, inherited in the 1950s. And um, so uh, we, three sisters, inherited the property, and we are very proud. Um, and also, you know, challenged to, to give that continuity that he started uh, in, um, in the 1950s. Well, I want to, if you don't mind, I'd love to talk a little bit, I'd like to go a little bit further back in your history, because... You come from a family of a, a historic wine family, and when we when I say historic, I'm I don't mean a few centuries. <laughs> uh, we're talking almost a millennial, right? Uh, a few more, I would say. Um, so my family goes back um, to the um, uh, year 1100, more or less. Uh, so yes, yeah, so as almost as you said. Um, so at that time, um, um, we were living uh, outside the city of Florence in Tuscany. Tuscany, and uh, we were merchants of silk, and then uh, we decided that we wanted to live inside the walls, uh, le mura, of uh, the city of Florence, and we started uh, in 1385 um, to enter the wine guild, uh, the Arte dei Vinattieri, mm -hmm. and started to be um, merchants of wine. Uh, so that was 1385, one of my ancestors called Giovanni di Piero Antinori. Now, let's talk a little bit. I think, I think a lot of people have heard the name Antinori. Do you want to share with us? I would love for you to share with us some of the wines that people might know of and people might not know of for Antinori. There certainly are um, a few wines that we produce. Probably the most um, known ones are the ones that we produce in the Chianti Classico, which is the heart of the Chianti area, uh, which we were producing at the time to um, uh, in the especially in the 16 1700s because I forgot to say that uh, at the beginning we were merchants of wine but then uh, um, after a few years we became uh, producers of wine uh, and in that gap who was really the produce uh, the producers of wine were the priests in the countryside uh, outside the um, uh, the city of Florence who were producing the wine drinking the wine <laughs> and whatever remained that maybe wasn't a lot we were selling in the city of Florence so after a few centuries we started to produce the wines too in the Chianti Classico and from there we have um, um, our estates that are probably the most known of, uh, of our family um, wines like the state of Tignan Anello, uh, the state of Peppoli, and Badia Passignano. And uh, for us, this is our DNA, the Chianti Classico, with, uh, you know, the uh, most important grape variety of the Chianti Classico, which is the Sangiovese grape variety. Now, I know Tignanello, that's one of those wines that kind of changed the wine, like, wine culture of the 1970s and forward, correct? Yes, uh, Tignanello has been a very innovative wine. Uh, this was due to my father because uh, he started to travel when he became president of the company in the 1960s. He went a little bit outside Tuscany, went to France. He saw the great results of uh, grape varieties like Cabernet and, uh, uh, and he brought uh, the grape variety of Cabernet to the Chianti Classico, and he started to experiment to blend the Cabernet with the Sangiovese grape variety that I was mentioning before. Uh, by law at the time, to be a Chianti Classico, uh, you were admitted only 15% of other grape varieties that were in the indigenous grape varieties, like Sangiovese. So instead, he uh, really wanted to produce a wine with a blend of 80% of Sangiovese and 20% <laughs> of Cabernet. It's like the exact opposite of what you can do. Yes, exactly. So. Uh, 
Uh, he really uh, decided to go a little bit against the laws. Um, so he produced this wine, Tignanello was the first vintage, was 1971. And uh, for that reason, he decided that um, um, he wanted to con concentrate on quality more than quantity. Italy was known at the time to be more a producer of uh, quantity after the Second World War, and he wanted to focus on quality. So he um, went against the laws. Uh, he couldn't call it Chianti Classico, which was the highest denomination at the time, uh, but uh, he had to call it Vino da Tavola, table wine. <laughs> uh, so in Italy, it wasn't really understood, but then he went to the US, and the Americans called it Super Tuscan. And it was the first Super Tuscan um, as a blend of a wine produced in the Chianti Classico, and now it's a category. So I think it really signed, this wine signed the renaissance um, of high quality red wines uh, produced in Italy. And uh, Italy was started from there onwards, started to be known, obviously, in Italy, but also abroad for to produce high quality red wines. I think that's that's such a great story. I mean, and I think it, it's so it's so funny because and not funny, but I find it you know you have by by that point there were 700 years of this history, this really really rich traditional history, and then all of a sudden he's like, I think I'm just gonna switch it up a bit and changes it. But uh, you know, innovation for us, um, there are two very important aspects: tradition, history, uh, our involvement with the family in the history. Um, of wine and arts too, uh, since many, many centuries, as we mentioned before, more than 600 years at this point, but also innovation. And innovation is essential for us. It's in our DNA. And um, uh, it's what makes the difference in also in our family. And uh, experimentation uh, is the most important aspect in the innovative part. And we experiment a lot, and we try, and we are curious, and uh, we go also we have been also outside our territory to discover other wine areas in the world, to learn what is happening also from abroad, and to bring it back also uh, what in is, our what territory. Are, what are some of those places that you particularly have been to that you've... Like, that uh, I've been with my father in many discovery trips uh, that uh, ended up in... Uh, uh, collaborations uh, abroad, for example, uh, one in um, uh, Chile, in the Maipo area, outside Santiago, uh, under the Andes, uh, with a winery uh, that's called Aras de Pirque, uh, that is owned totally by the family now, um, and we started more than 20 years ago. Huh. Uh, yes, in focusing in, um, on uh, grape varieties like Carmener, like Sauvignon Blanc, um, and then uh, uh, I went to Washington State with my father many, many years ago, and we started the collaboration with our importer, Chateau Saint-Michel, with a winery called, called Solare uh, from uh, the Columbia uh, River uh, Valley uh, in Washington State. And then probably the, one of the most important ones, uh, which I personally didn't go with my father because I was too young, but he went to Napa Valley in the 19th, end of the 1970s. He fell in love with... Uh, uh, the winery that uh, we own called Antica, which is the short name for Antinori, California, and also Antico, it means uh -huh. antique in Italian. And um, uh, that probably is one of our most beautiful projects uh, and estates that we have uh, uh, in Antinori. What part of Napa is it? It's on the hillside of Napa in the Atlas Peak District. Okay. Um, and it's uh, incredible because it's a beautiful valley uh, with more than 500 acres of uh, vineyard. And... Uh, um, on the other side, you, you have the view of the Napa Valley and also the Bay of San Francisco when it's beautiful yeah. weather, so when it's clear weather. And uh, it's a unique place. It's on the, on the hillside, so it's a little bit uh, more mountain fruit, so a little bit different than the wineries in the Napa Valley. But it's always in the Napa Valley, obviously. Well, I think one of the things, one of, well, one thing I, w I just want to tell everyone that um, I was saying to Alessia before we started talking, well, <laughs> well, we were talking, but before we started recording, was that it, even when I, even when I'm going to say it again, it still astounds me that your family is part of, and I'm going to, I hope I say this correctly, it's part of the, the Primum Famile Vini, the, ten, and you're the 10th oldest wine family in the world. Yes. And um, I uh, personally um, know the, um, um, our friends of the Primum Famiglia Vini, uh, all the wineries very well because I've been the president uh, twice. Oh. Um, we change every year, so it's a group of 12 of, I would say, if I can, they're the most prestigious um, uh, wine families in the old world. And um, 
it's a great group of friends. Uh, beyond uh, what we can do of uh, work uh, and business uh, uh, together uh, in um, uh, going and promoting our wineries and wines uh, all around the world, but we are good friends, and this is the best uh, part of it. And the most interesting part of it, I think, is that um, uh, how we get along all together, and especially how uh, we are seeing the next generation is getting along. Um, so we do these family meetings uh, once a year, um, and it changes the, uh, from uh, property to property. To where are, where are they located? Are they there's uh, um, so I can give you the there all the old world. Uh, there is from um, Portugal. There is uh, the Symington family, the owners of Dow's and Graham's. Uh, Port. Um, there is uh, Vega Sicilia and Torres from Spain. Uh, from Italy, there is um, Antinori and our cousins uh, in Cisa della Rocchetta with Sassicaia, Tenuta ah. San Guido. Uh, then uh, from France, there is uh, Drouin uh, from Burgundy, um, uh, Chateau Mouton. Um, uh, from uh, um, uh, Bordeaux. Um, uh, then there is uh, um, uh, Port Roger from Champagne. Um, then there is uh, um, Ugel from Alsace. Um, and then uh, Egon Muller from Germany. Um, I'm missing someone. Um, Sometimes I forget, and <laughs> all these uh, uh, it come to my mind. So they're it's all they're all uh, it's all European, yes, yes. Wow. all European or from the old world, and obviously the most important thing, um, it's all from uh, um, the old families um, wineries. So that's the most important aspect, and. Uh, as I said, it's interesting to see the future generation, and sometimes we do um, presentations of at least two generations together of each family. So, you know, it's what really, um, I think, can make the difference because uh, uh, wineries that are owned by families really can give, uh, um, can transmit values like uh, passion, integrity, and quality from generation to generation and give it, to a, uh, give it a continuity, which is what makes uh, us very strong too. Well, that's something that the other side of your family inspired in you because you were telling me, so one of the interesting things is she's mentioned she's from a very historic Florentine family, but we're not in Florence. <laughs> And you didn't grow up in Rome. We're in Rome, and we are at a place, as, we, as I mentioned earlier, called Fattoria di Fiorano, the Fiorano farm, we, I guess we could call it. But when you drive up, it says di Alberico, and that's your nonno. Yes, exactly. Uh, so on the property uh, that my grandfather inherited uh, in the 1950s, um, we... Uh, Wanted to give a uh, we wanted to give a continuity to this project, uh, which was very important for us three sisters, uh, that he inherited in the 1950s, and when he passed away in 2005, uh, we wanted to continue as he did it. So he was a noble Roman prince that could have done many other things in his life, but instead he was a real passionate uh, fanatic, I would say, of farming. And he drove his tractor every day of his life with his tweed jacket. <laughs> Uh, because he believed in it, he loved it. And for that reason, uh, when uh, I was living in Rome uh, I, a few years prior to uh, my grandfather when he passed away, I decided that I really wanted to continue with my sisters to uh, this beautiful project. And so he planted, he was very innovative because he planted in the 1950s uh, grape varieties uh, uh, inside the city of Rome, um, like Cabernet, Merlot, Semillon, uh, which were extremely innovative. And also, this is a farm that is um, an organic farm since the no 1950s. No pesticides, you were saying. He no was pesticides, no chemicals, since the 1950s. Because he believed uh, it at the beginning, obviously, but then he resisted in the 1960s, 1970s, to all this period of pesticides. And, um, and so, obviously, now it continues to be like that. So that's unique. We are inside the border of Rome. You we said are organic. It's about a thousand acres. A uh, thousand it hectares. was. It was many, many years ago, and then uh, nowadays it's 130 hectares. Okay. Uh, but we are inside the city of Rome, which is uh, so again, it's, people, it's, that, that's, it's mind blowing to to one. I mean, yes. If you go slightly outside the walls, you 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 know where the catacombs are, because we're 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 right on the Via Appia Antica, which is the oldest and longest road in ancient Rome, and 
you know, it's, it's a road that's still existent today. Um, once you step out, one of the, my favorite things is when we're walking by like Argentine and the catacombs, you, you know, like the, 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 you can see the pecore, you can see the sheep, and, and so all of a sudden it gets very rustic. But we're now actually in an, in an active working farm. There's an airport about 20, no, 15 minutes away, correct? But there's the uh, Fiumicino is 15 minutes away, Champina is a few minutes it's away. A few, it's yes. a few minutes away, yeah. exactly. You know, so we're in a metropolis. But we're also in this beautiful, beautiful farm. So it's, it's, I don't know. It's one of my those those beautiful contradictions or juxtapositions that happens in Rome. It's a triangle of paradise, um, and from here you can see the Eur, and then you can see uh, when it's clear weather also St. Peter's Dome. So you know it's it's unique, and uh, I think it's unique also because it's a farm 360 degrees. Um, which obviously our main uh, um, uh, main theme of this farm is the wine uh, because it's an historical winery. Uh, yeah, let's talk that a little bit about the wine. Producing since you know uh, many years and very innovative. Uh, but it's not only wine because we have also the vegetable patch uh, with all the ten great uh, the varieties of artichokes, uh, five different uh, varieties of tomatoes, and uh, because my grandfather really was love that and also we have our mother yeast and we produce our bread that it was his mother yeast that he gave to my sister and we continue to produce it we produce you know what i think i don't know if um do do, do we say it in english i can't remember now do we say that uh, uh, do we call it mother yeast in english? yes I th we do yes yes i think i think so yeah. yeah and i think that's just but i think like let's let's just return to that so this yeast was my, my grandfather was producing with his uh, wheat uh, his lievito uh, madre uh, here uh -huh. and and the farm and he gave some to my sister and so we continued it. That's amazing. And we produce our bread here, our pasta. We do everything here uh, with all that wheat and all that and then the flour and then the lievito madre. So it's a, it's all a, I I try to give a continuity to everything. We produce also our cheeses here uh, oh. from um, sheep's uh, because. He was, uh, he f was fascinated about, uh, about sheep and cows too. And so I gave, I added that. I wanted to add something <laughs> of myself. And so I did that. Uh, we produce our cheeses here too. So we have the cheese, little cheese factory. Do you produce factor. your honey here as well? We produce our honey here and olive oil, our lentils, our barley, um, our You produce beans. everything. Everything that, everything that we would eat, you eat you yes, all from here. Yes. And we have also on the property, um, uh, on the, uh, you know, the property in the sense of the land of, um, Fiorano, we have also a small um, um, little farm to table concept uh, called Orto di Alberico, which oh. is, as we were mentioning, um, it's the, it means the vegetable patch in honor of my grandfather because he had this passion. So um, there is also that on uh, this land, uh, which is a very special land because it's volcanic soil, and volcanic soil give. Um, uh, and really transmit to the, um, you can see from the, the from the uh, vegetables to the grapes, um, the sweetness because uh, it gives very, also very mineral wines. So that's very interesting too. So, you know, I, I am not a wine expert in the least. I enjoy drinking wine, um, but I have a lot of friends that study wine. And when I mentioned I was coming to visit you and I said, and they were like, oh, you know, and, and I think uh, some of it was the Forza Donna, very happy that this is a woman run organization. <laughs> uh, so let's just give a shout out to women right now. Um, and also because, you know, your wines are organic and I'd love for you to talk a little bit about your wines. Thank you, yes. Uh, so they have a history which is a unique history because as I mentioned, uh, uh, my grandfather planted the grape varieties like Cabernet, Merlot and Semillon in the 1950s, which were totally unknown, almost even in Italy. So he was the first one to produce them, to plant them inside the city of Rome at that time. <laughs> So funny. Nowadays, you think of Cabernet and Merlot, especially, uh, you know, grape varieties that are uh, very well known in our country, but at the time they weren't at all. And uh, Semillon, too. So we are, um, we have, um, from my grandfather, we inherited um, the historical vineyard, which were only four rows of Cabernet, four rows of Merlot, and luckily we found also three rows of Semillon. Um, so from those, we did a massive selection and a propagation in 19 hectares, which are younger because we started to produce in 2011 for them. So 
because having also on the property, uh, having also this uh, farm to table concept, uh, we wanted to show also our wines and we needed more an everyday wine. So from the um, uh, historical vineyard, we produce only 2,000 bottles of Fiorano um, Rosso and 2,000 bottles of Fiorano Bianco. The Fiorano Bianco is very interesting because it's a Semillon 100%. So it's the only one produced in Italy because generally Semillon is always blended with other grape varieties. Instead, we, were, we wanted this challenge to continue what he was doing of producing 100% uh, uh, Semillon. And the Fiorano Rosso is very interesting too because it's a Cabernet Merlot 50-50, um, which uh, has a lot of character. Uh, because be coming from these volcanic soils, you really can uh, taste uh, that the wine tastes of, of grapes, is, and also because they're organic soils since more than 60, 70 years. And then we produce our second wine, uh, which is uh, called Fioranello, and um, it's very interesting because uh, it's a more everyday wine uh, for the white, uh, uh, fresh, crispy, stainless steel, uh, very drinkable, the, either the white and the red. And I think this is very important, you know, nowadays to have also very drinkable wine, very fresh and pleasant. Now, I know more over the past, I've, I've noticed over the past few years, I would say the past two years, that people are talking a little bit more about Lazio wines. Absolutely. Well, Absolutely, yes. And I, I think uh, it will be, the, Lazio will be the future wine like the wines have been of Campania of Sicily and now of Puglia too so I think Lazio will be the next region of interest uh, there are also Cesanese which yeah. are really interesting great great small producers uh, we want to give a continuity to what my grandfather uh, have, have been has been doing so uh, we continue on the grape varieties that he planted I we didn't uh, add anything new uh, but certainly being a winemaker I'm always interested in Cesanese uh, because I think it's a, it's a very interesting grape variety Alessia has been talking about everything that they grow this is the kind of place this this is a, a place that you can visit and you can come and you can have lunch you can have dinner and you can eat everything. I, I would love to just eat every variety of artichoke that you have. I think that's that's amazing. I, I we make a pasta. We'll make a pasta shortly because the tomatoes are almost ready. And I uh, I insisted that you have to say in the dish uh, called the uh, the day the called the dish uh, with the three grape uh, the three varieties of tomatoes that you use. So it's very important because nowadays what makes the difference is the varieties mm -hmm. and uh, what these varieties can give. One of the things that I, I find particularly interesting about the wine world now is the relationship with contemporary art. So yes, uh, the Antinaria project goes um, back a few years uh, when um, we built our winery, uh, our new winery, um, more than six, seven years ago, um, uh, when the projects were, um, you know, um, being analyzed. My father told me that uh, he wanted to show the art that we collected throughout the centuries because um, we have been always um, very connected to the art world um, because many of my ancestors uh, um, have been uh, commissioning also pieces of art uh, in the Renaissance period. And they, you know, Florence is the heart of, re of the Renaissance. Um, so the arts, the architecture, the arts in general, the architecture, um, uh, the engineers, it, it was a, quite a small world. And uh, certainly my family was very involved in that. So um, we wanted to show this. So we showed it in a small, I won't say museum, but like um, chronological, uh, um, corridor or room uh, where we show our involvement uh, throughout the centuries. This is at the Antonoria Estate? Yes, in, in the Chianti Classico, so okay. our new winery, which is a beautiful contemporary um, oh, it's new... like a, it's a beautiful monument of contemporary architecture. Yes, yes <laughs> it is, absolutely. And for that reason, since it's a, a contemporary building, a winery, um, I thought that uh, it's essential to show the past of our involvement in the arts, but we have to show also what we are doing now, because one day what we are doing now will be the past. So uh, 
for the future generations, uh, I think it's uh, it's very important. So what we did when we started, when we launched, um, uh, we opened the, the winery, uh, we had two artists, and from there, every year we have one artist who we decide uh, with um, our curator, and uh, we, um, produce uh, a piece, we commission a piece, uh, site-specific, uh, with the artist uh, that comes and, um, and, uh, and, and then it remains there in the, in when, the winery. When did the winery open? In 2011? Yes. Okay, so, every, so, so it's like an artist in residence, it's, it's almost in residence, yeah. right? I know that I was really happy because I was looking through the list of artists and one, I've seen a bunch of really great artists and one that I've, I loved seeing at the Biennale last year uh, the Venice Biennale was Thomas Saras Saracens, and I hope I'm saying his name. Thomas right. Saraceno, yes. S Saraceno, yes. And I, so he had he had a piece. I don't know if you were at the Biennale. He had that that oh, okay. cobweb. It was like a spider web. It yes. was he's incredible. great. He's incredible. He's uh, um, he's uh, we we. Uh, uh, we uh, exhibit and um, produce this piece. Uh, at this point, it was five years ago. Uh, and um, was this the piece you were telling me about before with the globes? Yes, with the globes, the spheres, the spheres yeah. uh, that um, uh, that are in the air, more or less. And uh, um, uh, they have inside some um, of our plants. Uh, and um, the plants, there's a watering system that gives uh, them so, water. So, so it's like perpetual yes, nourishment. Yes, perpetual, which is unique. And it's what I like is that he brings nature from outside to inside the winery. So uh, this is really unique, and uh, his pieces are amazing. Um, he is doing so well, especially in the last years. Uh, so we really uh, started to believe in him, in what we do with m the majority of our artists, uh, when they're growing, when they're sometimes also even a little bit younger, uh, but uh, we like to follow them in the years. Um, so um, Thomas Saraceno, Rosa Barba, um, the last one has been uh, with uh, Sam Falls, which mm -hmm. was the first American artist that we chose uh, in the, in the Antinariat project, which has done a beautiful project, uh, um, very um, related to nature, which is one of the themes that obviously artists like, because when they arrive to the winery, uh, they most of the of them can stay and uh, uh, really being in residence. Uh, some of them stay 15 days, some stay one month, some of them stay less. It depends really on, on them. But they f uh, they fall in love with uh, a few themes, uh, which are the themes that are very important, essential for us: um, archives, history, um, nature. For example, and one that was very important is time also. Time, which obviously is very related to history. And um, that is one that uh, they like a lot. Uh, in the case of Sam Folds, it was more nature. In the case of Rosa Barba, it was more time. Um, and Giorgio Andreotta Calò, which is an Italian uh, um, artist, uh, was more on time. Thomas Saraceno, in a way, nature and time two together. So, you know, I think it's, uh, it's um, what they feel, their sensation. And uh, then we dis we discuss it together, but I leave them totally, um, you know, to to create what uh, what they like. For example, one of the most interesting also pieces that we own was um, uh, of uh, Stefano Arienti. Stefano Arienti is an Italian artist, um, and uh, he worked uh, with uh, the piece that we uh, commissioned. My my ancestors commissioned in the Renaissance period, uh, the Lunetta de la Ro de, of the Della Robbia. Della Robbia is a oh, very yeah, famous ceramic, ceramics. yes. Yeah. And um, so my, uh, my ancestor uh, commissioned that piece and was also uh, uh, com um, how you say, depicted on the piece close to Jesus Christ. And it's an enormous Lunetta of the Della Robbia that throughout centuries we, we lost. And then we discovered the, when the Brooklyn um, Art Museum called us uh, that uh, one of the board members of the Brooklyn Art Museum uh, went to Florence for art shopping in the late 1800s and uh, then bought the piece and donated it to the Brooklyn Museum. So they called us after many centuries, uh, <laughs> telling us, asking us if we wanted to you know, restore it since 
was of our family, <laughs> was owned by our family. I said absolutely yes. So this piece went to um, the Boston Fine Art Museum and to the National Gallery in Washington um, for a beautiful exhibition on the De La Robbia in the US. And after that, I decided um, with the Brooklyn Museum to bring it to Italy, back to Italy. It's an enormous piece. We are really big, one of the biggest. Um, and uh, it went to Bargello and I um, asked um, uh, Stefano Arienti to have um, a conversation, a dialogue with the De La Robbia piece. And so he produced these incredible two pieces. One is in uh, the winery. One uh, will eventually one day hopefully travel with the De La Robbia again. Uh, there is a real a dialogue of contemporary and uh, uh, old masterpiece. So um, I think this is very important because it shows how we go back also to the past, um, having those conversations, which are really interesting. Now, can anybody visit the, can anyone come to the, the winery in County and see the art? Absolutely, yes. The, um, uh, there are tours also related more to uh, wine and art, and obviously the tours more related to the wine. Uh -huh. um, that's uh, the essential part. Uh, but you will, <laughs> see, you will see the art throughout your tour, in any case. Mm -hmm. um, and as I said, it's uh, extremely related and extremely bounded, and it's what we like of it. Have you ever thought of of bringing some art here? I mean, I see, and I mean contemporary art. I yeah. see here, by the way, which I want to just tell everybody what I'm looking at is, I love maps. And so we're looking at, I think, I think Daria said it's like a Noli map, so it's from the 1600s. Yes. So there's this incredible map of Rome, and it's in color, which normally it's in black and white, yeah. it and it's right in front of us. So I'm very happy to see this gorgeous old map of Rome. I don't know, contemporary <laughs> art, uh, I, uh, I have, I'm very lucky because uh, I look after this winery um, and obviously um, a vice president of Antinori. Um, so I have my two passions, uh, which is looking at the, at the Antinori project and looking uh, going back to the winemaking, mm -hmm. which are really my two passions in this winery of uh, Fiorano. So I think... Uh, that I have my two passions and I like to separate them okay. in a way. Also, if I'm always, uh, you know, um, uh, involved uh, in all of them sometimes together too. So. Okay, well, I, I am really looking forward to having lunch. I'm really looking forward to walking around. We, I wanted to thank you for having me and thank you for chatting with me about all of this. Thanks, Erika. It's a pleasure and come back to visit us whenever you want. I would love to. Thank you. Thanks for joining me and Alessia in the quietest part of the city of Rome at the Fattoria di Fiorano. If you'd like to learn more, you can catch up on her art project at the Antinori Art Project.it. So A-N-T-I-N-O-R-I-A-R-T project.it. And Fattoria di Fiorano, that's F-A-T-T-O-R-I-A-D-I-F-I-O-R-A-N-O.it. If I'm a little too quick, don't worry. Take a look in the description in the podcast and swing over to ciaobella.co. The podcast episodes are all detailed there with even a little bit more story. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Ciao Bella. If you'd like to know more about today's guest, please visit ciaobella.co and click on the podcast link or go directly to ciaobella.co backslash podcast. Want more Italy? You can find all my episodes on iTunes and Spotify and Stitcher. When you have time, subscribe to iTunes and rate the podcast. What are you waiting for? And if you want to be part of the podcast, email me or DM me your Italy questions. To learn more about me and my work, go to my website, ericafierpo.com and follow my Italy adventures on Instagram at ericafierpo. Ciao, bella! And a very big thank you and hug to Massimiliano Yonta and Dis to Dis Studios, the producers of Ciao Bella who continue to make me sound and feel great. 